The Spirit of God is with you and also with you. Welcome to this virtual gathering of Washington Avenue Christian Church. My name is Nathan Russell, and I serve this congregation as its senior pastor. Thank you for inviting us into your homes and viewing locations for an online virtual gathering to reconnect with God and with one another. In the past, we've called this a service of worship, vespers, and evening prayer. Now we are in an alternative space. Things look a bit different. We are casual. We are relaxed. I hope you are too. This gathering is also an alternative to the myriad things that grab our attention and time. We pause from the streaming services and the endless scrolling of social media and inhabit another time. Call it alternative time. Come to think of it, worship itself is an alternative, an alternative to everything we have accomplished and have yet to complete, an alternative to decisions and demands, to muchness, manyness, and busyness. We premiered this gathering at 7 p.m., so you may be uh, just getting home from work or you may have returned from a grocery run. Maybe you finished your evening meal. Because this gathering can be viewed at any time, maybe you're preparing to go to work or maybe you've had to hit pause in between so that you can care for a child and you will return later. All of that is fine, good, and holy. You are welcome and wanted here. This is the alternative. Some things will remain constant. We will sing, we will hear, we will pray, we will share, and we will commune. Please sing with us as you're able. Our pianist Evan Collins will lead us in the hymns and the lyrics will appear on your screen. If singing is not your thing, perhaps more meaningful for you will be to create art or paint a picture, knit, crochet, or maybe internal silence is the most meaningful because you're feeling as parched as a sponge and you want to absorb as much as possible. All of that is fine, good, and holy too. We hope you will connect with God in ways that are life-giving, loving, and liberating. These ways may also be an alternative. So we ring this bell. And we light this candle to clear the air. Because our worship of God is about to begin. As we prepare to lift up our hearts, Will you join me in a query? A query is an ancient practice of asking a question that people of faith ask of themselves or one another. You can engage this question by yourself with a viewing partner in the live chat that's off to the side or with me on Twitter using our church's handle at W-A-C-C-E-L-Y-R-I-A. -E the question, the query is this. What is the gospel good news your heart longs to hear?
in God there is a welcome. In God we all belong. May that welcome be our song. Oh, we sing for all the children that one day they will be free. And we sing for generations yet to be. That they never have a reason to doubt that they are blessed. May they in your love my rest. Oh, may our hearts and minds be open when the church doors open wide. May there be room enough for everyone inside. For in God there is a welcome. In God we all belong. May that welcome be our song. Oh, we pray for all the young lives cut short by fear and shame. So afraid of who they are and who they love. May the message now be banished that your love is for the few. May their faith in you renew. Oh, may our hearts and minds be open when the church doors open wide. May there be chapter 8, verses 12 through 25. Listen for the good news that these words invite us to imagine. So then, beloved, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, 
who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. For the promise and covenant of the good news. Thanks be to God. When my brother Joseph and I were in our early grade school years, we would wake early on Saturday mornings, spring forth from our twin beds in our shared bedroom, run into the master bedroom, and hop on top of our parents' queen-size bed, never giving them a warning of incoming two children, ready or not, move your legs. Somehow, our parents always received us in love. Truly, their welcome had to have been grace because it was early, and they had not yet had their coffee. Joseph and I would sit up on their bed, bright-eyed, full of energy, and ask them, Tell us the stories of when we were born. Joseph and I never tired of hearing these stories, and Mom and Dad never seemed to mind telling them to us. Each time they told the stories, new details emerged. Some of those specifics I remember to this day, like how my granddad, my mom's mom, had tears in his eyes because his daughter was in the pain born of labor. For everyone's benefit, other specifics of our births need not be repeated. It's been many, many years, close to three decades, since Joseph and I invaded our parents' bedroom and asked them to tell us the stories of our birth as if for the very first time. Joseph and I are grown, and now Joseph and his spouse, Julia, have children of their own who invade their bedroom on Saturday mornings asking, Tell us the stories of our births. It's payback, I guess. But last night at 11.03 Ohio time, I called my mom and asked, Will you tell me the story of when I was born? Instead of immediately going into the story, mom asked me what I was up to at such a late hour and I explained to her that I was writing a sermon and on Romans chapter 8, right there in the middle of the chapter, and there's this language about groaning in labor. Okay, my mom replied, don't tell everything you know. Not everything needs to be repeated. I promised her my discretion. My parents had tried to get pregnant for over a year. They hoped for children, but there was a bit of a wait. And speaking of wait, I learned for the first time last night that the pregnancy test my mom took in late August, early September 1979 was no five-minute rapid test with a plus or minus result, but something that required sitting overnight. I wasn't there, but I can hardly imagine my parents catching any sleep that night, for waiting, for hoping, for anticipating a longed-for result the next morning. Sure enough, the test was positive. Mom was with child. Over the next several months, Mom prepared a nursery with blue, green, and white checkered patterns, animal cutouts affixed to the curtains, a crib, and honey bear sheets, honey bear bumper pads, and a honey bear mobile. The late March due date came and passed. No baby. One day, two days, one week, two weeks past the deadline. More waiting, more hoping, more anticipating were required of the parents-to-be. Finally, on a Saturday morning in early April, Mom said, I think it's time. They went to the hospital, and my mom expected she'd deliver later that day. But no, there was more waiting, more hoping, more anticipating. 
Even my dad left the hospital and got a Kentucky Fried Chicken. This detail was brand new to me last night, and let's just say my mom is still not over that one. Not cool, dad. Not cool. My parents' parents arrived at the hospital around 7.30 that evening. The doctor reassured everyone, it won't be lo much longer. The baby will be here. Hold tight. Be patient. Apparently, I had made up my mind not to hurry things. I was already two weeks late, so what were a few more hours hanging out in my mother's womb? The doctor came back again with a revised timeline. The baby will be here by mm, 10 p.m., but I was not ready to budge. Sometime after 10 p.m., nurses finally moved my mom into the, into the delivery room, and the full labor process began. Mom had been through the Lamaze classes. She knew her breathing patterns and had something on which to focus during the pain of contractions. Details are scant here, but my mom, fierce person that she is, went all natural for the delivery. Finally, at 12.02 a.m. on Easter Sunday, she gave birth to an eight-pound, six-ounce boy. In writing to the churches of Rome, churches not with steeples or physical addresses, but small communal gatherings in homes, Paul encourages his recipients, saying, We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have been the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. I can just hear women offering a rejoinder to Paul and his toxic masculinity, saying, and what would you, Mr. Apostle Paul, know about labor, delivery, and childbirth? The know-it-all letter writer should have offered a caveat before co-opting another's narrative. Paul could have said, I have not experienced labor myself, but women have said it's like this, and I believe women. I trust their stories, their experiences. For those about to give birth, there is eager longing, there is groaning in labor pains, there is waiting and hoping and anticipating. This disclaimer may have been just enough to let Paul's metaphor slide as he tried to help people reflect on their present suffering. Conflict among peoples was commonplace. Political unrest was a present reality. And we're talking about Rome, just so we're clear here. Paul longed to give the Christians in Rome a metaphor, an image, so they could interpret or somehow make sense of their ongoing suffering. God did not cause the suffering. Rather, suffering was the currency required of peasants living in Rome and under Roman rule. The churches in Rome needed to know that somehow this suffering meant something, that it would be transformed. Paul said, the suffering you are experiencing is real. It's terrible, and it hurts like hell. But I want to tell you with everything I've got that the suffering is going to be worth it. And not just worth it, there will be no comparison between the present suffering and the glory that God is about to reveal. The glory by God will be revealed to you and in you because the glory of God is for you. I know, I know it's hard to fathom, so, so think of it like this. Remember that imaginary story that helps us picture the beginning? Yes, that beginning way back in Genesis, the garden, the first humans, Adam and Eve. Things go south. Earth gets cursed. The whole creation becomes an exercise in futility. It isn't what God wanted or intended, but it happened. And ever since then, all creation has been waiting, hoping, and anticipating liberation, freedom from bondage to decay. 
Creation is groaning in labor for a new world that is about to be born. Humanity is part of creation too, and we know these labor pains. We feel the contra contractions within the core of our very beings. We're waiting for something new to be born in, to us, in us, and for us. It's the glory of God, and God's glory will be revealed by God. Just hold on a little while longer. Wait for the glory, not passively twiddling your thumbs, but actively waiting, which means persistently hoping and expectantly anticipating with every ounce of energy that you can muster. Be on the ready. Hope against hope. Hope for that which you cannot fully see or make out, but have caught a glimpse of out on the horizon. Wait for it. Hope for it. Anticipate it and be patient. I promise the glory of God will be worth it. Now push. When my grandmother was with my mom in the delivery room, my grandmother touched my mom's forehead with a damp rag, wiping the sweat from her brow. She whispered to my mom, saying, The labor pains will be worth it. Just wait until you hold your baby for the very first time. Then you will know. The present pain won't hold any comparison to the glory of a newborn. If my grandmother's words sound familiar, you may be thinking of Jesus who said, when a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. Creation is still waiting with eager longing. Creation is still groaning in labor pains. We are too. We are suffering through a global pandemic. This suffering is new, at least for most of us in the United States. The myth of American exceptionalism has been jerked from beneath our feet. We've realized that we are frail, frail creatures of dust, and our bodies are mortal and susceptible to contagion and disease. We don't have merit badges in suffering Though, I would like to begin a Kickstarter campaign for bumper stickers that say, I survived 2020. But all of that seems to be an exercise in futility. But, what if this present suffering in the midst of a global pandemic does not compare to the glory of God that will be revealed to us in us and for us. This glory does not take us back to time to a time in March or a previous era in life, but calls us forward to a new future with a new hope, a new creation, and a new heaven, and a new earth. I have not experienced labor myself, but my mom tells it to me like this. And I believe women, and I trust my mom, her story, and her experience. The story goes like this. For those about to give birth, there is eager longing. There is groaning and labor pains. There is waiting and hoping and anticipating. Like those early Christians in Rome in the first century, we're waiting for something new to be born in us, to us, and for us. It's the glory of God, and God's glory will be revealed by God. We're waiting for the glory, not passively as if watching grass grow, but actively waiting, which means persistently hoping and expectantly anticipating with every ounce of energy we can muster. 
Let's be on the ready. Hope against hope. Hope for that which we cannot fully see or make out, but have caught a glimpse of out there on the horizon. Wait for it. Hope for it. Anticipate it. And be patient. The glory of God will be worth it. Something new, something beautiful, something good is about to be born to us, in us, for us. Because, church, our hour has come. Take time to breathe, beloved. Labor is never easy. Count in and out. Focus on the glory of God that is to come when the contractions hurt like hell. And finally, finally, gird up all the strength you can muster. And push. Amen. This prayer is an alternative to the ways in which we normally pray. This prayer is active, not passive. This is a body prayer, one that will engage our full selves. And I invite you to participate with me in ways that you find helpful and meaningful. So church, will you fold your arms and bring them toward your stomach as if in pain? Let us pray. Womb of life and source of being, you created this world. You gave us birth, but all is not yet right. In fact, so much, too much is wrong. Sin and death remain powers that try their very best to delay your reign. We are suffering, O oh God, and we feel that suffering acutely now more than ever. We are physically separated. We cannot gather in ways we prefer. And it hurts like hell. We also grieve what we have done and left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts or our neighbors as ourselves. Forgive us, we pray. We are longing and we are groaning as if in labor for your new world that is to be born to us, in us, for us. The forecast looks grim, and it seems that our suffering will not end. And yet you, O oh God, inspire us with hope. You rescue us in hope. And one day, one day, you will get everything you want. And your glory will be revealed to us, in us and for us. And now, church, I invite you to lift one or both of your hands in anticipation of the glory of God that is about to be revealed. Oh God, we can imagine your glory out on the horizon, but it feels far away and out of reach. Help us to strive toward the future that you promise. Oh God, we feel the whiplash as we move from despair to optimism. But hope is altogether different. Hope transcends our feelings and reorients us to an alternative way of life. Give us the grace and grit we need to live by the power of your spirit. 
Oh God, help us to live as a people, as a church whose hour has come. Let us be people in waiting, in hoping, in anticipating, in pushing with you so that all creation may be liberated, set free from its bondage to sin and death, born anew. When that happens, oh, that will be glory, glory revealed. Glory indeed. And now, church, I invite you to bring your hands toward your heart in a posture of devotion as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. we come to this table, we want to begin by inviting your requests for prayer, your celebrations of joy. There is a link below in the video description where you can submit one online. It is our joy to accompany you in prayer. We also invite your gifts, your time, your talent, your treasure. A link below is in the video description that opens our web portal for online giving. Your gifts and contributions sustain the ministries of this church as we participate in the mission of God. And finally, we come to this table. It is an alternative table like none other in this world. We remember that on the night Jesus met at this table with his disciples in an upper room, he first washed his hands, and then looking upon the table, he found gifts of grape and grain. He took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, 
And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and after pouring it out, he gave thanks for it. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant poured out in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, and do this in remembrance of me. For as long as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we participate in the birthing of the new world, the brand new world that waits to be. Come, beloved, everything is ready. And now, church, go into the world and tell the good news. Remember that you are never, ever very far from God's heart. Embody the gospel that is an alternative to the ways of this world. And trust with everything you've got that God will have the future that God wants. It's already underway. Amen.